ओम ज्ञान ज्ञानाजलिशलाकाय चक्षुरोन्मल ये ना तस्म श्री गुरव नम नम ओं विष्णुपदा कृष्ण पृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदात स्वामी नामिने नमस्ते सारस्वती देव गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चातिशतारिणे वाचाकूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतिता पापनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्रीअद्वैतगताधार श्रीवासादिगौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा ग्रेटफुल टू बी हेयर and the lord ships gone at i in another this month so as nurse mujit that she is coming uh, next saturday so i'll be speaking over the next week on the prayers by prahlad to lord nurse mujit the most well known prayers by shri prahlad maharaj come in the ninth canto of shri bhagavatam which is near the climax of the past time of narsimha of narsimha lila is described in the bhagavatam there is also another set of prayers which appears here in the fifth canto while the description of the universe and its various residences is being given so these happen to be uh, seven prayers some which we will discuss over the next few days as time permits uh, seven eight prayers are there so i will speak on the theme of god as the supreme therapist i will mean, analyze the psychology of prahlad maharaj psychology of hiranyakashipu and we'll see how the lord reciprocates with both of them according to their desires ye thamam prapadyante tam sathaiva bhajamya mama vartaman vartante manushyah partha sarvashah in 4.11 in the bhagavad gita krishna says that I have procured everyone according to their desires, and all people are on my path. Mama Vartamanu Vartante Manushya Partha Sarvacha. So even the godly and the ungodly, they are all on the path of Krishna. But they are at different directions and their different orientations. Those nuances we'll discuss. Now, about a century ago, if we look at the kind of prayers that people offered even 50 60 years ago the primary vision in the uh, there's a there's a book about the history of christianity and how religions change over time so the primary image of god historically has been god as the cosmic provider uh, oh that that is embodied in the well known prayer of oh, father thou art in heaven hallowed be thy name give us our daily bread So the idea is that God is our provider. We need various resources for living in the world, but these resources are not very uh, easy for all of us to attain. So therefore, we pray to God. However, in the last fifty, sixty years, uh, last hundred years, we could say, especially the Western world has become significantly prosperous, at least at the level of physical needs. So. the need for god is not felt so much as a physical provider of physical needs that many uh, sociologists especially secular scientists and secular sociologists they predicted that religion and god would die out as science and technology advances frederick nietzsche had famously or infamously said or said he was a god is dead so he had predicted the death of god but eventually there has been a surprising resurgence in religion all over the world 
it is <coughs> the the historical narrative that historian especially secular historians had thought was that actually as science and technology advances as people start understanding this whole idea of god and everything believing about the other world and this and that is all mythology and people will reject it and that is the triumph of science so many secular secular atheists secular and atheists who pride themselves on their science they are exasperated by so many people seem to be religious in fact whether it is uh, america where uh, there are evangelical churches which have huge turnouts or whether it is the middle east where religion is again becoming very very strong even in india the more and more people go to various temples and various religious groups so what exactly happened now of course when all these people are practicing their going to some kind of religious practice they uh, may not be practicing properly according to what their scriptures have taught but the point is people have not become atheist en masse as was prophesied by the humanist narrative narrative of secular humanism so if we see especially in the christian churches now people come to god not so much for getting their material needs or physical needs provided for they come to god for getting mental peace and the churches have also recast god not so much depicting him not so much as a physical as a provider of physical needs but as a provider of mental peace in that sense the image of god that emerges from the mainstream religious depictions in today's world is of god as a therapist you are agitated you are worried you come to god and you'll become peaceful and this is something where modern science has to a large extent failed to provide for inner peace although we have psychiatry which can provide psychiatric medicines but several surveys repeatedly done and rigorously examined have shown that most psychiatric medicines just antidepressants which people take these med or anxiety medicines they have no greater effect in healing people than do placebos placebos are simply sugar pills given to people without telling them so yes people on taking antidepressants do feel better but they feel equally as much better if they were given sugar pills and they told their medicines so whether it is the medical science that is healing well or it is just the psychological expectation that i have been treated and so i will heal that is healing them is open to question and in spite of the tranquilizers and that kind of antidepressants being taken up uh, more and more people are mentally agitated in fact the whole kind of medicine called and tranquilizers or mental health medicine they were unknown before the 1960s and now they are the biggest over the counter medicines to be sold so there is profound distress at the psychological level and the uh, the emotional distress that is there among people this can be treated in various ways so the main difference between psychology and psychiatry is that psychiatrists prescribe medicines psychologists primarily focus on what is called as talk therapy talk with people get them to express their emotions address their emotions through counseling so psychologists usually are not allowed to give medicines so here the that means we can say that when people have psych- people have problems in dealing with their emotions people have problems at the level of the mind there are different ways in which they can be dealt with so one is through phys- through biological uh, biochemical medicines the other is through talks and many people for within we could say a kind of talk could be religious talks go and hear a spiritual message and that helps people calm down so if we consider god is the ultimate provider of everything no aham sarvasya prabhavo mattah sarvam pravartate that he everything comes from god 
then even peace of mind also comes from him. So to depict God as the cosmic therapist or as the supreme therapist is not wrong. However, this can be an incomplete understanding of God. Because with this understanding, we may focus only on what God does for me. Shri Prabhupada writes in the first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam that normally there are four Purusharthas Dharma, Artha, Kama, and Moksha. People practice religiosity so that they can get financial prosperity. And then by that they can satisfy their desires. It's Artha and Kama. And then it leads to Moksha. It leads to liberation. So now he also says that among these four, Artha and Kama is what most people are primarily interested in. So if Artha and Kama can come without Dharma, if people can get money and pleasure without needing to do any religious activities, then they feel Dharma is redundant. If you don't need it. So that's why when People started, especially secular humanists, started to say that through science and technology we can provide prosperity to you. Through science and technology you can fulfill your desires. Why do we need God? So that it did happen that dharma seemed to go down. But dharma has emerged again. By, actually by dharma or religion, I'm using it in a very broad sense of having some understanding of some higher reality and doing something to appease that higher reality and to get something from that higher reality. So, the religion has resurfaced in a big way as a provider of mental peace, as a provider of inner well-being. Now, in, so in that sense, the idea of God as a cosmic provider and the idea of God as a cosmic therapist, both are similar. Because in both, the focus is on what God can provide for me. We are not interested in God per se. We are interested in what God provides me. So if that same peace can come by some other means, then, it, then the people will say, okay, I don't need God. But if peace doesn't come by other means, then they go to God. So now, <clears throat> I'll speak on this theme of now how bhakti heals our emotions how connecting with Krishna actually is the ultimate therapy by which we become gradually and eternally joyful. But this is a gradual process which takes time. So here the verse is Om Namo Bhagavate Narasimhaya. I offer my obeisances to Lord Narasimhadev. And Sri Prabhupada writes in the prayers that is Karma Shayam. Karma Shayam means a strong, deep-rooted material desires within us. And these desires cannot be uprooted by any means other than devotion. And he says that Hiranya Kashipu represents the craving for fulfilling material desires. And <clears throat> that has to be uprooted. Randhaya, Randhaya. Please destroy. So the epics are both historical and trans-historical. That means the narrative of Srila Prahlad Maharaj, it describes, it is itihas, itihas, this is how iti, this has, this is how it happened. It describes a narrative that happened millennia ago. At the same time, it also, it is not just a story of something that happened long ago. It is also trans-historical. That means, it represents transcendental principles that apply to all time beyond the historical context of that particular period. So Prahlad and Hiranyakashipu are characters who are representing exalted devotees and incorrigible demons. And both of these are also tendencies present in our own hearts. So we could apply the epics, uh, could approach the epics and the narratives within them in two ways. One is only historical and the other is only metaphorical. It's only historical, this is a story that happened long ago, nice story, entertaining story. 
I've heard it once, now what next? So if we apply it only as historical, then it just becomes a story for entertainment. And then we feel, how is it relevant to me? After hearing it, it's like once we, uh, sometimes there's a movie review on a newspaper or something, then they say spoiler alert. You know, people want to actually go in a movie and watch the movie and enjoy the movie. If the review is going to tell the whole story, then people say, I will not have any fun enjoying it. So normally in a story, the primary, uh, primary enjoyment is in the suspense. What is going to happen next? What is going to happen next? But if you know the story, then we find there's no suspense over there. Now, of course, some stories may be so riveting, so attractive that we want to just read it again and again or hear it, watch it again and again. That's something more than the, just the plot turns and twists. There is some emotional connect that we make with the characters in the story. And that's why you want to see how it's going. So, so some, same way, if we just see this past time as only historical, then if we, there's no suspense, then what's the use? And if you have to make an emotional connect with the characters in the story, for that, we have to see the relevance of those characters with us. And for seeing that relevance, we have to see that the stories are not just historical. So, so one, the other approach could be to so treat, treat the stories simply as metaphoric. And actually this didn't happen. The Kurukshetra is just a battlefield. Kurukshetra represents the human consciousness. And the Pandavas represent the good desires within us. The Kauravas represent the bad desires within us. The bad desires always outnumber the good desires. Now this is a reductionistic way of looking at scripture. By the scripture is used, reduced to simply a metaphor. Now these scriptures do have metaphorical dimensions to them. So, but when normally the word metaphorical is used, it is used to supplant the literal. That means it's only symbolic, there's nothing literal in it. But in the Vaishnava understanding, the metaphorical supplements the literal. It doesn't supplant the literal. Supplement. It doesn't su supplement the literal. Sub supplant means to replace. That means only metaphorical, not historical. But the metaphorical supplements the literal. Means we accept the metaphorical, we accept the literal, but we also see that it is a trans-historical narrative and it has higher values to it. So, Shri Madhvacharya, in his commentary on the Vedanta Sutra called Brahma Sutra Bhashya, mentions that the epics can be understood in three ways. Says they can be understood as literal, they can be understood as ethical, and they can be understood as spiritual or metaphorical. So, literal means that this is how it happened. And just hearing it will purify us. We don't need any analysis, just hear the recitation of the past time, it will purify us. Ethical means that we have to say, okay, this character acted like this in this situation. But this was a wrong decision. This character acted like this. So we draw lessons for our own life in terms of how we should act ethically in various situations. That's, so this is beyond the historical. We are looking at the relevance. And at the spiritual level, we understand that these are past times happening in the spiritual world. And they can happen even in our own hearts. So Shri Bhakti Vinod Thakur uh, has written uh, this not metaphorical explanation of Krishna Leela where he said, he said the various demons in Krishna Leela represent the anarthas in our own hearts. He's talking about it in Krishna Samhita and especially in Chaitanya Shikshamrat. So two of his books. And then he says that when we hear a particular passage of Krishna, then the demon which is represented by that, the, the anartha, the unwanted uh, disposition, the unwanted emotion, the unwanted thought pattern that is there within us, that, and that is represented by a particular demon. So that unwanted thought pattern, those unwanted desires will get eliminated from our heart. They get purified by hearing the Krishna Gita. So we could see Hiranyaka Shippu and Prahalad as historical characters and we could see them also as representations of mentalities within our own hearts. And these mentalities within our own hearts, they make us act in particular ways. So by understanding, now of course, whenever the scriptures teach anything, 
they often teach by giving extreme examples. So extreme examples means, if we consider, to talk about how attachment can distract us. So for us, you know, we may be reading some scripture and suddenly some Facebook notification comes up and we start watching, reading that or watching that. It's a distraction we find in this 10 minutes, one hour. But in the Bhagavatam also illustrate distraction, it talks about how Bharat Maharaj had left the world, gone to the forest for the purpose of exclusive concentration and then he got attached to a deer. And by being attached to a deer, he got so distracted that he spent his whole life tending to that deer. The deer became his foremost attachment. And it was not just for a few hours that he was distracted or even for a few years. It was for a whole lifetime he was distracted. And not in that lifetime, but even the next lifetime when he was as a deer. Of course, during the deer's lifetime, he, he by the mercy of the Lord, remembered that I got distracted. He was careful. But he could say he lost almost two lifetimes. So the power of distraction is illustrated in a very, very extreme, graphic and scary way in the Bhagavatam. By showing how just attachment to something like a deer. Now a deer... We could say is a, uh, Bharat Maharaj's distraction was sattvic. It was not rajasik or tamas. It was not in the mode of passion or ignorance. He was not chasing after sense pleasure. He was not chasing after intoxication or anything like that. He simply wanted to protect a deer that was, was bereft of its mother. But even that could distract him. So the Bhagavatam illustrates its teachings by giving extreme examples. So similarly, you can say Prahalad and Hiranyakashipu, both are extreme examples of the devotional mentality. Prahalad is extreme, the word extreme is used in a, in a negative sense. We could say Prahalad is the example of an exalted devotee. And Hiranyakashipu is a representative of an extremely demoniac person. Now we don't have devotional tendencies within us as strong as Prahalad's. Nor do we have demoniac tendencies as strong as Hiranyakashipu's. But these tendencies are both there within our hearts. And we will, over you know, the next few days, look at this pastime from a psychological perspective, understanding what thoughts were going on in whose minds, and how that affected their actions, and how that reflects the way they perceived God and the way they related with God. <clears throat> so, karmashaya is deeply rooted material desires. And they, uh, this verse offers a prayer that, please remove them from my heart. Randhaya, randhaya, tamo krasa, krasa. These arise from ignorance, my dear Lord, please remove them. So, this karmashaya, this craving for worldly pleasure, because that represents the hiranyakashipu in our heart. And uh, that, uh, that is like the hiranyakashipu in our heart. And the uh, prayer for the Lord. Randhaya, randhaya, please destroy. Om Namo Bhagavati Narsimhaya. I offer my obeisances to you. Please, avir, 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 please become manifest. This is the devotional tendency within us. This is the prahlad within us. When nowadays, <coughs> so there are these two tendencies within us the prahlad tendency and the narsimhaya and the hirandikashma tendency. The godly tendency and the ungodly tendency. And this notion that there are, there are multiple forces within us, or at least two forces within us, this is implicit in the very name of the genre of literature that is the most popular, that, is, that has become the most popular over the last one century or so. Among the, in literature, there are two broad categories, there's fiction and non-fiction. In non-fiction, the literature, the genre of literature that sells the most is self-help. Is self-help. That's what. Its memoirs are there. There are do-it-yourself books are there. There are history, geography. All these various genres come in non-fiction. But among them, the most widely read are self-help. Now, when we talk about self-help, let's try to analyze the concept. The self is going to help. Who? The self. The self is going to help the self. That means that there is an understanding that there are two selves. There is the self that 
is going to help and there is a self that needs help. So there is a self that is going to help them. You know, when you feel like this, do this. So that means there is a, there is a self that is feeling like this. When you feel depressed, when you feel when you have negative thoughts coming in, start thinking positive. That means there is a self that is thinking negative. And there is a self that is choosing. Oh, should I think negative or not? Maybe I should think positive. Let me think positive. So this idea that there is there is there are multiple selves within us, or at least there is a dual self within us, that is implicit in in the very name self help. So we could take the same principle and expand it. Now self help can sometimes be in a religious context where some people say you turn towards God and He will help you. The power of positive thinking was one of the most popular books in self help. It was written by a Christian pastor. Norman Vincent Peale, and he said to uh, widely be, uh, promoted the genre of self-help literature. So, uh, there are many others who are simply secular humans. They are not necessarily against God, but they are not necessarily for God also. So, self-help can be just, there is a self which needs help, and there is a self that can offer help. So, so this, if we expand this further, we could say that the self that needs help is the Hiranyakashi tendency. And the self that can offer help, that is the prahla tendency within us. But in bhakti, we, the self that offers help, okay, do this, don't do this. That self doesn't depend only on oneself. We, we get self-help, the self connects with the supreme self. So, there is a popular saying, God helps those who help themselves. Shri Prabhupada could also quote that. And his mood in quoting that was that you know, we have to work hard. We have to endeavor to serve Krishna. And then Krishna will help us. So that is true. But the way often in the material world this saying is used, God helps those who help themselves, is that actually you don't have to go to any temple and pray to God. You don't have to do any religious ritual. If you just do your work, if you help yourself by doing your work properly, by being disciplined, by being determined, then God will help you. So God helps those who help themselves can be seen in a non-devotional context or in a devotional context. In the non-devotional context, we see it, actually Krishna himself speaks this, speaks this in the Govardhan Leela. When the Vajivas are performing a yajna for Indra, at that time Krishna says, Actually, if we, if, we do our, if we take care of the cows, if we do our duty, Indra is, ob Indra is obliged to do it, so we don't have to worship. So the Acharya has explained here that Krishna is simply inciting Indra over here. And Krishna is not necessarily speaking the absolute truth over here. He's a small child, and it's a part of his Leela. So, you see, hermeneutics, hermeneutics means the this, the branch of knowledge which is about which and which analyzes how to understand scripture. It is the art of understanding scripture or understanding truth. It's so important that sometimes the absolute truth may not be speaking the absolute truth. Krishna is the absolute truth, but he may not be speaking the absolute truth. That's why statements always have to be seen in context. If we don't see the statements in context, then we can make a mess of understanding things. In philosophy of language, the question comes up, where is the meaning of word stored? Is the meaning stored in the dictionary? This word means this. Or is it stored in the minds of people who are using them? Now actually, it is both. The meanings, the words certainly have some meanings, but which meaning applies when? That is dependent on context. And usage also varies. Suppose somebody asks, you know, why did Humpty Dumpty have a great fall? Because they had a great spring. <laughs> Get it? So fall can refer to falling down. Fall can refer to a season. So it has a great spring and there's a great fall. So the words can mean different things at different times. So, <laughs> why do you have a great fall? Because they had a great spring. 
the where i am going with all this is that the mean that when we look at the context that is when we understand things properly without looking at the context if we just look at uh, certain statements then they may be misunderstood so similarly with respect to the idea of worshiping god with the idea of praying to god and getting some help getting some relief for our inner distress by our worship of god the principle is that um, what is the context in which i am worshiping what is the context in which i am worshiping so if the context is i think oh, this world is a place of enjoyment and god should arrange for my peaceful life in this world that oh i want peace of mind because i'm going to god and get peace of mind so that i can be peaceful and happy in this world so that is the context of materialism or you could say that is if you are coming to god you could say that is the context of mixed devotion and if i am going to god and pray to god please let my mind be peaceful so that i can serve you better so that i can practice the process of bhakti better so that i can purify myself better by which i can become absorbed in you by which i can ultimately attain you so then here the context is the context of pure devotion it is this. so approaching god can also be done in the material context or it can be done in the spiritual context and largely in today's world when people approach god as a therapist they approach him in a material context that okay you can make me peaceful so that i'll be happy here but when we as devotees are approaching the lord we also need a peaceful mind because it is a peaceful with a peaceful mind we can study shastra properly with a peaceful mind we can chant hari krishna properly with a peaceful mind we can we can interact with each other in a in a sensitive respectful and harmonious way so just as we need food as a body need for functioning in the world similarly we need a peaceful mind so that we can function in the world so food is a need of the body peace is a need of the mind and if it is provided for within a devotional context then it can help us to practice bhakti more and more if our mind is agitated then we can't focus on krishna so as devotees do we approach krishna as a therapist we don't approach krishna primarily as a therapist within a material context we want krishna to heal us completely so that our desires get redirected from this world to him by which we can ultimately attain him so the hiranyakashipu and the prahlad who are there within us the ungodly and the godly tendencies we want uh, when we are approaching krishna it is like the prahlad within us is approaching and is in the hiranyakashipu is there in my heart my dear lord please eliminate him. please free me from him at that mood when we approach the lord then we can slowly but steadily become peaceful as well as pure so there is um, there is pacification of the mind and there is purification of the mind i'll conclude with this theme which i'll be elaborating much much more in the future sessions that when we say oh lord he is saying please destroy the ignorance within my heart tamo randa randa krasa krasa the ignorance that is there in the heart my dear lord please destroy it so now what exactly is the ignorance the ignorance can be understood in various levels if i am driving a car i don't know how to drive a car or i don't know what traffic signals me that is ignorance at a physical functional level that prevents me from acting properly at a physical level there could be deeper ignorance there is there could be medical ignorance you know, i have i have cough but when i go to doctor doctor says you got tb for me it was just cough but for the doctor the diagnosis is tb over here so i may have a lot of i may just have a lot of negative thinking within me i might be very anxiety ridden for me it just oh some people are less worried some people some people worry less some people worry more we just why do i worry so much but the bhagavatam says that these last time we did the prayer illusion there are also things 
they are impressions within the mind and they can't just be wished away when somebody worries too much tell them stop worrying sometimes it may help but if it's a if that worrying has become a tendency in the mind then they just cannot but worry it's the mental level is also a real level it's like somebody's feeling cold and you tell they tell i'm feeling cold don't feel cold is what do you mean don't feel cold <laughs> i'm feeling cold <laughs> so if if somebody is worrying they don't worry but what do you mean don't worry i'm worrying so i will analyze further is worry an emotion that is just an emotion that comes within us or is it an object within us which makes us worry we'll discuss this a little later which will be analyzing i wish we be analyzing how to deal with the negativities of the mind at various levels but the point which i want to make here is pacification and purification pa- pacification means i am agitated and i become peaceful that is krishna i want to come i want to come peaceful and we come to krishna we come to the temple with the darshan of the deities we hear the kirtans we do feel peaceful but if that is all we come to krishna for if we are involved in some intense project we are doing good service good distribution we are doing some temple management we are wanting to build a new temple we want to arrange a program at that time when we come to the temple the coming to the temple may cause us more anxiety i have to get this done i have to do this i have to do that i have to do that i have to do that so at that time if our expectation is that i want to be peaceful then i say yes, serving krishna is not making me peaceful i should try to serve krishna is causing me so much anxiety so then where am i getting the peace so so here you can understand pacification simply means that whatever is the agitation agitating stimuli i just remove it from my mind so for example i may go to a natural scenic place and everything around is there is gentle breeze blowing i can see the birds i can see the vast sky i can see a stream moving along i can hear the birds chirping this is what this kind of scene is what is depicted through most guided meditation sessions and is a immense of you know people sit down and they meditate and the the meditate meditation guide tells them to close their eyes take a deep breath and transports them through visualization to a peaceful place and people do feel peaceful over there this peacefulness this they do experience it but it is temporary what causes the agitation is not just the external situation what causes agitation primarily is the inner disposition if i have lust anger greed envy pride illusion these are within me i will be agitated sooner or later so it is in my if i go to a peaceful situation i feel peaceful but again i come back again and agitate so what bhakti does is sometimes bhakti may simply putting that externally in the situation which is increasing agitation hey i am in the middle of the city i have to go here i have to go there i have to go there shri prabhupada was in the it was peaceful when he came to america we had to go here go there there was anxiety about that but what bhakti does is it may externally simply putting us in situations that have some agitation also but bhakti removes the internal cause of agitation that is the the neg the attachments within us the unwanted uh, anarthas that are there within us so bhakti will offer us purification and through that purification when our heart is attracted towards krishna a purely then there is the supreme peace and the supreme joy and pacification is offer us something temporary temporary relief but pacific purification is the cure now how within a devotee's life pacification purification can both be provided by the lord uh, is something which we will discuss in our future sessions i'll summarize what i spoke today i spoke on the theme of god as the supreme therapist we are we discuss we are discussing for last prayers to narasimha dev in the fifth canto and while discussing these prayers is talked about how historically god was seen as the cosmic provider 
but now in the western world with basic material physical needs being provided for uh, the secular humanists thought that god and religion will become redundant and people will become wholesale atheistic but religion has shown remark remarkable resilience and even resurgence why because there is some need of people that is not being provided through material technological progress and that is the need for peace and for fulfilling this need for peace god has been recast in mainstream religions today as a cosmic as a supreme therapist as a cosmic who will not as a cosmic provider of physical needs but as a provider of inner peace and within this narrative <coughs> the idea is that people when they are agitated through medical psychiatric means sometimes they get some relief but it's a plus like a plus doesn't last and they get more and more dependent on that so through religion in a more healthy way they can get relief now the i discussed about when we approach god we approach him within a particular context so the idea that god is a therapist is not necessarily wrong not as necessarily right it is how we are approaching it we could approach god in karma kanda for as a cosmic provider where we are interested in god not in what he who he is but in what he is doing for us similarly when we want peace of mind also we are interested in god simply for getting peace of mind and if we get it by some other means then what is the need for god uh, so i discussed about how words uh, don't have meanings in isolation we have to look at the context to understand the meaning of the word so uh, that context is needed also for understanding krishna's words in govardhan leela the absolute truth does not always speak the absolute truth so hermeneutics is important to understand the context and by which to understand the content similarly our world basic world view is the context which determines our actions so if we approach god as a therapist in a materialistic world view then we will stay at the material level of consciousness and that is either materialism or mix that is material piety or mixed devotion but when we approach god in the spiritual world we make him as our ultimate goal and making going to him to serve him eternally as the ultimate goal then we approach him within a spiritual context so just as peace is a need of the this as food is a need of the body peace is a need of the mind and we as devotees need food for serving krishna and we also need peace to serve krishna if our mind is agitated we can't chant we can't study we can't interact properly at the same time if we make peace as the sole expectation for connecting with krishna then services which require responsibility which sometimes cause anxiety if what is the point of peace So we differentiate between pacification and purification. If we just just going through external physically peaceful stimuli, projecting ourselves mentally to a physical to a scenic situation, can give us pacification. But the real cause of agitation is not just the external stimulus, but the internal anartha within us, and that anartha needs to be removed. So I talked about how this Prahlad uh, and Rani Kashipu are historical characters. but they are also trans historical madhacharya says scriptures can be understood literal ethical and spiritual or metaphorical levels so two extreme approaches could be uh, seeing scriptural narratives simply as historical or simply as metaphorical we see them as both historical and trans historical so prahlad and anandikashipu are historical characters and they are also tendencies within our hearts so in self help there is a self that needs help but the self can offer help so similarly within us there is a hiranyakashipu that is creating trouble for us and others and there is a prahlad who wants who, who wants to who wants to deal with it so we want to empower the prahlad and see material life self help simply means that we think we can help ourselves but a devotee the seek self help by connecting with the supreme self so god helps those who help themselves but we help ourselves by connecting with krishna through the process of bhakti So, how the connection with Krishna can give us inner peace? Let us discuss in our future sessions. Thank you very much. Re Krishna. Are there any questions or comments? Yes. Thank you.
Thank you, Guru. Um, just about the verse, I have a question. You know, he's mentioning, um, please appear in our hearts and drive away our ignorance. He also says um, to vanquish our demon-like desires. And I'm just noticing how he's using the word our instead of mine. And uh, I'm just, um, I'm wondering, you know, I wonder about this law before because, you know, we don't want to see others as like, you know, ignorant or demons or something, especially devotees. But it seems like this kind of prayer is especially potent to not just pray for oneself, but to pray for all of us. You know, like, all, please help us, Krishna, not just please help me. And to, and to ask for help, um, one has to, you know, think that they need it, you know. So I, if I want to pray for help for others, then I also have to think that they need it. If I want to pray for others to get out of ignorance or to purify their, you know, materialistic tendencies or demonic desires, I also have to think that they have those desires. So uh, is that okay to, to have that kind of mentality that, yes, we all, we're all afflicted by demonic desires, please purify, help us, Krishna? Or is it more important to just keep a reverential mood towards all the movies and don't know they're all, you know, they're all serving Krishna, there's, you know, it's just me. Okay, good question. So if we say that, uh, if you hear the word plural is used, us is used also. So if we, can we pray that, other, that others be freed from their demoniac desires or should we try to uh, just see that everybody is serving Krishna and not even think that others have some lower tendencies within them? We cannot, we cannot live in the world with closed eyes. This is physically we cannot walk about with closed eyes. Similarly, relationally, also we cannot walk, we cannot interact with people uh, by closing our eyes and not looking at the individual natures. And every individual nature is a constellation of strengths and weaknesses. So now we can't not notice the weaknesses that people have. There is one thing which is, which is noticing it and the other is stressing it, harping on it, reducing people to their weaknesses. And we say some people are just forgetful. Now, if we label them, they are forgetful. And then that, that determines everything that we, everything, all of our interaction. That is unhealthy. At the same time, if something important needs to be done and if we know that they are forgetful, either we give it to someone else or we give them repeated reminders. So we have to, we have to be real in our interaction with others. But while being real, uh, we need to focus on others' good. We are aware of people's shortcomings. We don't have to harp on them. We don't have to reduce people to those shortcomings. We have to see that everybody has good within them. And we try to get inspiration from their good. And we also try to engage their good side as much as possible according to our position. Srila Prabhupada was obviously aware when he came to America of the many deficiencies that his early disciples had. And their own, the only regulative principle of the hippies was to break all regulative principles. So, but Prabhupada saw the good. They have some interest in Krishna. They have some eagerness to serve Krishna. And that is what he, that is what he found. So praying for others, especially, uh, the word demoniac is a little strong. I prefer the word ungodly. We have godly tendency and ungodly tendency. It's a little softer word. And we don't want to say that devotees have demoniac desires. But we all have lower desires. We have ungodly side within us. And praying uh, for someone else, uh, specifically asking Krishna to help them overcome a particular weakness. That can actually, generally, our, the more specific a stimulus, the stronger becomes the emotion associated with it. More specific a stimulus, the stronger the emotion associated with it. For example, if I say, oh, the earth is being ravaged by uh, global war, by climate change. Okay, uh, that's the big thing. But if you say, uh, there is a garden, there was a beautiful forest near my house, uh, where I, in my childhood I used to play. 
and that has been this, that is destroyed by climate change then that actually evokes stronger emotion so in general uh, abstract principles they may appeal to the head they may appeal to the intelligence but they don't evoke emotion it is specific facts specific examples so if you say oh the world is filled with suffering krishna please relieve the world of suffering well okay yes but if i have a specific if i know specific look, this devotee has got this disease this devotee has got this problem krishna please help so the emotion is always stronger with the stimulus with the specific stimulus not just a universal principle the same principle applies even when we are praying for a devotee just krishna please bless this person that's a, that's also a very generic prayer we could offer that prayer that bless this person could be interchangeable we just replace a with b with c with d but if it's a more specific prayer krishna this devotee has this this ability please help them to develop this ability by which they can serve you more and please protect them from pride while they're engaging in this using this ability in your service then because the stimulus becomes more specific then the emotion also becomes stronger so in general offering uh, specific prayers which acknowledge people's strengths and acknowledge their which focus on people's strengths but also acknowledge their weakness and pray to krishna to help them develop their strengths and help them to manage their weakness they can actually become very powerful ways in which we can ourselves connect with krishna and evoke krishna's blessing on others okay thank you yes yes bro Can we discuss this tomorrow? I mean, this is an elaborate subject. I'll answer it briefly, but in the future session, I'm going to discuss this more. Is mental health a result of karmic reactions? Mental health problems a result of karmic reaction? Or is it coming something from the physical stimulus? Okay. Do mental reactions exist? Yes, of course. Baldev Vidya Bhushi says in the Govinda Bhashya, this commentary in the Vedanta Sutra, that sometimes some people get bad dreams so i know one one person he's afraid to sleep because as soon as he sleeps he starts getting nightmares terrible it's a terrible condition to be in the body needs sleep but this can't sleep so now baldev devshan explains that uh, in the dream state ishwara gives a, uses the dream state to give us uh, reactions to our minor karmas reaction to our major karma come in the jagrata stage so you know, i may meet with an accident i may get fracture my arm that's a major reaction coming at the physical level but in the dream my car collided with another car and i get i get injured i get a fracture that's also painful it's scary but that is really short lived so in that sense uh, if we could say that the dreams exist at the mental level the body is not involved physically so much but the mind let us see so there is an example for reaction at a mental level uh, similarly if we consider every desire that we indulge in there is a physical reaction to it if somebody drinks alcohol repeatedly then they are going to suffer from some liver diseases or other health issues but a more damaging consequence is that that desire becomes stronger and stronger so the desire indulgence making the desire stronger that is also a reaction at a mental level and generally another way is that i might have been living in sattva guna in the mode of goodness but then if i keep indulging quantumly i may go down to raja guna and tama guna and that brings it to the whole mindset which makes me more and more vulnerable to negative emotions so mental reactions do exist the mental level is also real and now specifically when something happens to us whether it is a result of past karma or whether it is a result of present karma or present situation that separation is very difficult to right? say i am walk, walking along the uh, the road and i slip and fall and i fracture my leg now i have to fracture my leg because 
of my past karma as meant to slip and fall or was it because i was just lost in my own world and i did not see that there was water spilled over there it's both it's both karma is a complicated subject but you know generally we say karma means action pro this action produces this reaction but actually in our daily life we see sometimes a small action causes a big reaction and sometimes a big action may have a very small reaction we may sometimes drive drunk over for 6 hours and nobody catches us and sometimes somebody may just drive you uh, drive in a drive drunk for 5 minutes you just uh, just a little distracted and then knock over someone and the whole they are put in jail and a big reaction comes up so basically the, uh, the law of karma is no, is gahana karma of atikshna says that be surprising of this think of karma as simply this action produces this reaction but it is not that simple action produces reaction but which action will produce which reaction and when and in what way in that past karma also comes into the picture so for somebody who is meant to have a healthy body you know, they may they may walk on the water but they might just look around they might they might slip on the water when there's a pole near by they catch hold of the pole and nothing happens to them somebody else who has got a bad karma at that time they slip on the water and not only fall down but their head falls where there's a sharp rock over there and they crack their head so the same slip may happen and both may happen because of inattention right now but the consequence may be very different for two people because the it's not that a will produce b as a reaction to a alone when a produces reaction b that also is determined by our past karma so similarly with respect to mental problems also no you know if there are two people a and b and both of them are chastised for making some mistake no a just takes the chastisement like a blow on the chest and moves on and b gets chronically depressed by the chastisement and feels i can't do anything and just gives up now why is such a big reaction because you know, by their past karma they were in a vulnerable position at that time and their mind was fragile and it became overall by that so mental reactions do exist and for us rather than focusing on why something has happened is it because of present karma or past karma our focus should be on how best i can deal with it and what that means practically we'll discuss in our future sessions okay so thank you very much ग्रंथ्राश्रीमद भागवत की श्रील प्रभुपाल की गौर भक्तवृंद की